Hello everybody, this is the lecture 4. Today we're going to be talking about opportunity recognition. Before I go to the slides, let me tell you a little bit about opportunity recognition. Many people have many different ideas and you probably have had many business ideas, right? The first thing you have to learn about starting a business and ideas is that the fact that you have an idea doesn't mean you have a business. There's two reasons for this. The first one is that your idea will change when it hits the market. So as soon as you get an idea, if you start working on that, you're going to realize people might have the need that you're trying to solve, or you're going to realize people do not have the need, and then you have to change the idea to adapt to the market. So everything, when it comes to business, is about execution. It's about who took the idea, and who made it happen, okay? So when we talk about um, opportunity recognition, we're not talking about, you know, you having an idea. We're talking about you systematic, systematically saying, okay, I have an idea, I'm going to make this happen, okay? The very best way to, to accomplish this is to scratch your own itch. And if you were reading rework, uh, which you should have uh, been reading for this week, you should know what I'm talking about, right? When you scratch your own age. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Then I'm going to give you the screening um, test for the ideas that I told you in the first class. Um, I'm going to give you a link for that so you can, uh, you know, um, validate the ideas through that if you will. And also we're going to talk about brainstorming and coming up with a with an actual idea. And if you're reading Rework, the great thing you're going to notice is that they contradict a lot of what I'm going to say, but at the same time, they, they kind of say the same things. So when it comes to entrepreneurship, you're going to find a lot of these, you know, uh, redundant advice and at the same time, opposite advice when it comes to how to do things. And your job as an entrepreneur is to look at the market and follow your God and make something happen. Okay? So don't think it's, uh, it's actually by coincidence that I have uh, that book so you guys can see uh, the different point of views, right? So let's get started with the actual slides. Okay, so right here we have two people and if you read the book you're going to notice the first one it's a guy with a vacuum cleaner. His name is James Dyson. And if you're familiar with vacuum cleaners and expensive ones, you have probably heard about Dyson cleaners, uh, vacuum cleaners. So this person, James Dyson, he was an engineer. And one day he was vacuuming his home and he realized that the vacuum wasn't doing a, a good, uh, the vacuum cleaner wasn't really doing a good job. So he decided to do one that did it well. And boy, he did it. Like right now, uh, uh, Dyson Cleaners are a huge corporation. He's been doing uh, several designs of vacuum cleaners. And I know he's in some other space that I can't remember right now. But the, the point that you have to take away from this is that he didn't woke up one day and say, hey, I want to do a new vacuum cleaner with no context. Well, the book, what they refer is that, you know, he saw the problem, he knew he could solve it, and then he did it, he solved it. Uh, you know, going back to uh, Steve Jobs, there was a talk I listened about him, uh, that he was given in 1980-something, where he was saying that he got lucky because he solved a problem for himself, and it so happened that many people had the same problem. So... You know, you can say it was luck, and you can say it was business, or you can say it's a, a bit of both. But the underlying point is that you're solving a problem that you are facing already. So that's one of the main things you have to think when you think about a business. Are you experiencing this problem? If you are, chances are other people are going to experience it as well. The other lady we have there is a lady called Mary Kay Wagner. If you are familiar with businesses that people try to introduce you to, chances are you have heard about Mary Kay. 
uh, the product, the cosmetic products, right, the skin, skincare and all this. Mary Kay uh, Wagner, she was, um, okay, let's talk about her quote first, which I love, that's why I put it here. If you think you can, you can. And if you think you can't, you're right. So, you know, this is yet another person beside Napoleon Hill, beside Steve Jobs, beside um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and beside Les, Br uh, Les Brown, who are telling you the same thing, which is if you can think of something, if you think you can accomplish something, you're going to. All right? So, you know, don't take my word for that. You know, just, just look, uh, notice the pattern here. You know, go, going forward, Mary Kay Wagner, she was the founder uh, of Mary Kay, and she used to use this product, this cosmetic, uh, cosmetic skin product. She loved them. Um, she loved them very much, and she used to buy them from a, dent, uh, from a dermatologist. When this person passed away, she went to the family, and she bought the right for the formula, and she created Mary Kay on that. You know, right here it's proven. She was using the product already. She was happy with it, and then she saw the opportunity, and she took advantage of the opportunity at that very moment. So that's also something that you have to be aware of. Like, you know, she was already using the product. She knew it was good. The next step was just to make it, uh, to commercialize it, right? Very important. Now, when we're talking about opportunity, we're always going to talk about the window of opportunity. The window of opportunity is the time where you can make something happen. There are several examples about the window of opportunity and a company when they start not being, not having the right timing. And this is especially um, dangerous when it comes to companies and ideas. Sometimes you have the right idea, you just don't have the right timing. That means your window of opportunity, you either miss it or you, or it's not open yet. So, uh, you know, a regular day example would be the people who bought houses back in the 2001, 2002, maybe 2003. If they sold their house, they made a lot of money. But if you bought it in 2007, chances are you are on, you know, underwater and you are upside down on your loan. So, the window of opportunity closed to be able to flip the houses when when the economy tanked. Uh, that's just a regular everyday example. When it comes to other companies, there are companies, in, especially in the dot com era, where you know many things could happen, but they didn't because the infra infrastructure wasn't there. You know, uh, the, one of the examples was Pets.com. They wanted to to make it where people can buy the, the pets online, but the, the distribution costs were very big, so they went under. Maybe now, if you start the similar concept, because the distribution maybe has improved, then you will be able to be successful at that. So, you know, sometimes you can bring an idea that failed in the past, but you have analyzed it and you think that it failed because of uh, the window of opportunity not being there and you think it's right, it's the right time, that's when you want to take advantage of that, okay? That's when you want to say, okay, now it's the time to make it happen. Now, how do you know if there's a window of opportunity? Uh, you're going to have, uh, of course, customers willing to pay. That's the most important thing. If you want to have a successful business, and I, sound, I know it sounds very redundant and very, um, what name? Very obvious is that you need to have customers. When it comes to customers, we're going to talk a special breed of customers called, called the early adopters, which are the customers who would be able or are looking already for a solution that your product is going to offer. And these customers, they're called customers because they're willing to pay. So somebody who uses your product and somebody who, who likes your product but they're not paying, they're called users or friends or family or something else. They're not called customers. A customer is a person who pays you for your service or product. Okay? Be aware of that. Another one is a competitor. If you have, if you have no competitors in a market, chances are the market is not there. This is not true all the time, but something that you have to understand is that whenever you are 
starting a business, you should have a lot of competition. Now, you know, it's a good market to enter when there's many competitors, they're all very small, and there's not a clear market leader. So when you do that, you know that people have not decided on, on one company yet, so there's still a chance. Right now, if you want to fight, you know, if you want to start a computer company uh, selling to enterprise, Windows is going to be your biggest um, competitor. The question is, do you have the resources and do you have the power to fight against Windows? Chances are you will not, so that's not the right time to, for, to make this opportunity. On the other hand, you might have, and this actually happened a couple of years ago, that a, a little company in uh, Kendall, uh, Florida, down in South Florida, they opened a gaming hardware company. They were doing computers for gamers. And they become huge. Uh, they called Alienware. And I, I think uh, Dell bought them eventually for I don't know how, my, how many millions of dollars. So they found an, uh, a small niche where, they, they, where there was no clear competitor, and they built for that. So, and I mean not clear competitor, but clear market leader. So, you know, you can find these opportunities when you start segmenting and when you start really uh, analyzing uh, the whole uh, industry. And that's when context comes relevant, right? Once you start analyzing the industry, once you start looking at what's happening, you're going to realize, oh, you know, I see this opportunity here, I see this opportunity there. So, this is very important. Now, when we're talking about technology, especially new uh, products, we're talking about the diffusion of innovation. So if you see the yellow line, that's the percentage of people using your product, okay? Which means the market share of your product. When you're talking about uh, the blue line, we're talking about how people adapt to new products, okay? And then you see here to the left, we have the innovators right here. Then we have the early adopters the early majority, the late majority, and the laggards. Okay, so just to put it in context, um, whenever a new technology comes out, we do not all get the product at the same time. Actually, as a matter of fact, smartphones are just crossing this part of becoming part of the late majority. So if you think about it, we have been using smartphones for, us for some time already. But only now, last year, is when they passed this tipping point where, they, where the late majority is going to now use, use them. What does that mean? That means that until recently, only the early majority and the early adopters and the innovators were using the smartphones. But before that, the early majority wasn't really using them. It was only the early adopters and the innovators. And these are a special type of uh, special type of customers, which are the ones who are willing to switch to your product and give your product a shot. When we're talking about innovators, they are inventors. They are people who get very excited about new technology, who are always looking to get the newest and latest technology. When we're talking about early adopters, they are people similar to the innovators, but they're more consumer. The innovators are more inventors, more like they like thinking with stuff. Early adopters are more people looking for the solution that you're offering and at the same time willing to pay for it. So the early adopters will be the people making lines outside Best Buy or outside at the Apple Store whenever a new iPhone is coming out. Okay, these, these are people, the early adopters. They get a, a, a rush just, just because they have the new technology. The early adopters would be the first one who bought a DVD player, a Blu-ray player, an LCD screen. You know, they are the ones who pay way more for this technology, even though they know the technology will be cheaper later, they just want to have it first. So these are the early adopters, okay? It's a special type of customers. We are, we are not all, all early adopters. So you have to kind of think about yourself and say, okay, where do I fit in, 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 in this uh, bell curve? Sometimes you will be an early adopter. Sometimes you will be an early majority. Sometimes you will be a late majority. Sometimes you will be an innovator. And finally, sometimes you will even be a laggard. You know, the laggards are the ones where you can, let's say, let's go back to the cell phone analogy. The laggards are still using flip phones that are not smart at all. And they will use them until 
they break and when they go to the store they will ask for another flip phone but if there's not other phone that's not a flip phone then they will buy a smartphone so the laggards are like you don't want to sell to a laggard because they will just never buy your product okay uh, a late majority they will wait until the early majority uses it and the early majority the early majority they're waiting until the early adopters uses it so there's this trend of people just waiting and seeing how other people react to it and sometimes it could be in catch-22 like how do you get this customer if you don't have any customers and that that that's why we need and that's why you need to look for the early adopters and the innovators now there's a great book called Crossing the Chasm by uh, Jeffrey Moore and this book explains how we how companies get started and then some of them go bankrupt because they couldn't cross that chasm that you see here in, in red and some of them could now the main difference is that you know many companies can find what is an early um, an innovator and a, and a small group of early adopters but somewhere in there they cannot cross this chasm which is like the hyper growth the reason why they cannot cross this is because the products are not prepared for this market or even this market so as a result they fail okay so the book basically contends that in order you can start your product doing a simple service and people will buy it and you will get some traction but as you grow you will need to have a full product that can satisfy the needs of a bigger market and that way you can close the chasm okay the important thing you need to know right now is that people adopt technology at different pace and that depending on the company and the context they will on, or they will not buy your technology or your product or your service okay so the first thing you have to do if you're starting a company, especially a software company, um, is get this type of special type of customers, which are the early adopters and the innovators. Once you get enough early adopters and innovators, you have to start tweaking your service to make sure you can move forward to the next uh, type of early adopters and also go and go mainstream. With all these green things, that means mainstream. That means regular people. You're in the newspaper. People use it you are already a household name such as Google or you know Pandora radio and stuff like that in this process in between can take years just to to come from here to the green side okay now how do we come up with ideas we we'll come up with ideas in many different ways one uh, great tool when it comes to validating ideas or coming up with new ideas is brainstorming. Brainstorming is just a way of making a group of people all think about something at the same time. You know, often in order to solve a problem or to create a good idea. That's just the definition in the dictionary, and we have a little group of people dancing around a light bulb. <laughs> the whole point of this is that you use brainstorming to create ideas. Now, when it comes to brainstorming, uh, some people like it. To generate new ideas, some people don't because they think it's too scattered, uh, too of a um, scattered process. But there's a time and place when you want to brainstorm. Brainstorm, brainstorm shouldn't be used to come up with a new idea from scratch. You should, you should first assess a need, and then and then brainstorm different solutions for the need based on the technology that you have available. That's the way you should brainstorm. You know. You don't want to be brainstorming problems. You want to be brainstorming solutions and things that you can do to solve these issues. Okay, so here's a tool on how to create a, a brainstorming session. So the very first one is that you have to, you want to have a, a, a collaborative environment. You want people to talk about problems. And as I said before, you want to state everything around a problem. So you're going to be talking about a problem, not a solution. So you're going to be talking about, you know, you having to drive and spend 20 minutes driving from your home to the university every day. So that's the problem that you're spending time. You're wasting your time just driving to the university. So 
you know, maybe you say, okay, maybe we can teletransport and that will take five minutes or instead of 20 minutes. Or maybe you can come in a bike and that will, you know, uh, it will take you 30 minutes, but you will be doing exercise, so it will be better for you. And, you know, you start brainstorming, but all around the same problem, you know. You're going to brainstorm solutions to a, to, a, to a stated problem already that's not going to change. The, the ideas are going to change because you, you want to get many different ideas, right, uh, on how to solve that problem, but then you're going to bet them and see which one's better. That's why quantity is better than quality when it comes to brainstorming. You want to get many ideas and then build on top of those ideas, okay? Those, uh, and you want people to be collaborating and, and, and saying wild things, you know, like the tenant transportation thing I was talking about a, a moment ago. When, when people are just saying, oh, you know, maybe, yeah, yeah, I haven't thought about tenant transportation. Let's, let's, let's talk more about this subject. And then you start building upon the ideas and sometimes you, you have crazy ideas that they're, um, you know, like spaceship ideas. But then you can say, oh, you know what? Maybe we could do something similar to this if we were to tweak this here and tweak this there and you can come up with solutions. Okay? So that's what I, what I was talking about, combining and improving ideas when we're talking about, you know, just building on top of ideas. And you want to make sure everyone's heard. Brainstorming is a collaboration process, so if not everyone, everyone's being heard, people are going to be resentful, they're going to stop contributing, and you're going to have at the end of the day just one person talking about their ideas and not really going through a brainstorming process. So here I added a couple of links so that you can see how to brainstorm. This, the first one is very good. And then the second one is the screening opportunity. And we're going to take a quick look at both of them. And I'm going to, let me just move the really fast. OK, so the first one we have here is the screening opportunity. Um, when you open the link, you're going to see there's the screening. Oh, this is not what looking for. This is the quick screen, that's what it's called. And then it's, you see it's a questionnaire. It's going to ask you many things about the idea and the competition and the value you're creating and the potential. And then you add them up and then you have something. And then you have the Venture Opportunity Screening Exercise, which is the longer version of that. It's just asking you more questions, more questions. And then it asks you how to uh, evaluate them. So I'm not really a fan of this. I want to make you aware that they exist, just so that you can um, use them and you know maybe you find them more useful. But I really think what the way you want to find the problem is first by by seeing what problems you have that are not being satisfied by your current solution. The reason is very simple. When you are having a problem that you are not having satisfied, first, you're going to know when you solve the problem, so you don't have to do a lot of testing and market research and validation, because you're experiencing the problem. So you know, you, you are your own customer, so you know what to build for yourself. Uh, the second one is that sometimes you can do all the research in the world, but if you, do, you know, you might be getting wrong information from the researchers, and also the research is not always completely 100% what you're looking for. So there's always this miscommunication on, or mistranslation of the research into conclusions, and then it might be that they, they might not be recommending the right solution for the problem, and you might know better, right? This is a great blog called For Entrepreneurs. Uh, this guy talks about many different things, and, and this is a great post about brainstorming and how to create um, an idea. So basically saying, again, you want to talk about unmet needs, about problems, about you know things that are not working right, and then you want to research and find new technology, and the little conversion in the, the collision of both will be a new problem. So you know he goes here about about examples of Google, like what was the unmet need or pain that people were having before Google, right? 
So they were talking about a better way of finding things on the internet before there wasn't. Now after Google, now we have Google and everybody uses it because it's just so good. So they invented this thing called a page ranking and that's how Google um, uh, sorts the pages whenever you search for something. Same thing with Cisco, you know, they wanted a way of connecting computers to each other and they invented a protocol, the TCP IP protocol. So they solved that problem. And you see all these companies that they that he's giving uh, a, a problem and then how they solve it. Your company should be as simple as this. One line of a problem, one line of a solution. If you have it more than that, chances are you're still not clear about that. But you know what it's saying is here that when you have a problem, then you have this disruptive technology, but you also have you can also have new business models. So Sometimes you just use the same everything and you just improve upon uh, the business model, which is, you know, some examples of that are Groupon, Singa, Kill, Salesforce, Angry Birds, 99design. All of these, they have new business models which create a new way of making money using the same technologies that already exist. But then, what this article is saying, like, yeah, we're humans and we have needs that sometimes are not met, but also we want to be entertained. So when it comes to creating new products, you can have either, you can be meeting a need, which is, you know, um, we need like good tweet every, ta every time, but you could also be meeting an entertainment, like Cirque du Soleil. They, you know, we don't need to go to the circus, but we're going to be entertained, so we'll go there. So, you know, he's putting here a framework that you should read through, and then he just coming up with all these ideas on, on, on the things that could happen, just, just, out of that. So this is a great resource just to kind of see how you can think of how you can create new products and new ideas and just how you can think outside the box. And you can use this for your everyday life, you can use this to create new projects and you can use this to if you're working for a company and you just need a new way of increasing sales, increasing revenue, in, you know, all these processes, things that that will help you out. So, let me see if I have something else on the screen. I think that's all. Yeah, so the, um, on the PowerPoint, you're going to have the, the assignment, and it's about the same thing that we're talking right now. It's about you telling me something that you bought that solved a problem for you. So right now we're switching more, like we already know how you have to think as an entrepreneur to be able to start your own business. Now we're moving towards like, okay, how do we start? I'm ready, I'm pumped up, I want to start something. Today we talked about, okay, this is how I can recognize ideas. This is how I can see that my idea is going to be worth something. So now we're going to be moving into and diving into really how to uh, put everything on paper and how to start going which is the hard part, right? Ideas are one in a million, and everybody has one, but we want to take you from having an idea to having a full business by the end of the quarter. So ask any questions that you guys might have. I'm more than happy to answer all of them. And please send feedback, like if you are not understanding something and you think I'm doing, I'm doing something good, I want to know about that too. Um, so yeah, I'll see you later.